Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is David Garfs. I'm uh, on the High Council of this stake and am presiding over this meeting, and I'm thoroughly grateful and honored to be in your presence today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'd like to go over the agenda today. Our, uh, for your information, uh, the, as I said, I'm David Garce. I'm presiding over this meeting. Uh, conducting, I'll be conducting. I am conducting. <laughs> and I'd like to welcome you all again here to, to be here with us today. We have three announcements before we'd like to start today for your information. The firesides like this will be held every month on the fourth Sunday at 6 p.m. The next fireside will be held on Sunday, October 22nd here at the Union Fort Stake Center. That's 7155 South 540 East in Midvale. The speaker for that uh, service will be Colleen Johnston. The second uh, agenda on the announcements is that information about firesides can always be found online at addictionrecoveryfiresides.com. And finally, the 12-step meetings and family support meetings will be held after the, the fireside this evening at 7.30 here in this building. We're going to have an opening song by John Canan. And it's called Consider the Lilies. And the opening prayer will be offered by Sister Bowman. We'll have then a special musical number, Keep Looking at My Face by John Canan. And Elder Dixon will introduce the speaker. We'll go to that point on the agenda. a song by Roger Hoffman and I want to preface it by saying a couple things. One is I'm grateful as much as of course this universe is what God made for us on this earth. I am grateful that he is personal. Don't you love that? that? He personally pays attention to us, loves us. It's not the universe. The universe is a wonderful thing. But it's him. I love that scripture that says um, that he wanted the nations, you and me, to seek after God, Jesus did, and feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. Gene Cook had a situation uh, 30 years ago or so where he had some important people coming over for dinner. It was very important for Brother Cook to really impress this particular guest. And to do that, they had in mind a special dessert, but to create that dessert, they needed their egg beater, which they couldn't find. And Sister Cook, now just with a little time left before the guest arrived, was frantic with the um, housekeeper, professional assistant that they had, and, Sister Cook running around everywhere trying to find that egg beater. And the nine-year-old son came in in the middle of the commotion and said, what's going on here? And we can't find the egg beater. We don't know what to do. And the nine-year-old said, have you asked God where it is? Smart boy. And the housekeeper said, you, know, you don't ask God stuff like that. Well, he went up to his room and the Housekeeper, thinking perhaps she'd been a little curt, followed him quietly. And there at a door that was just partly open, listened to the boy's prayer, which was, Heavenly Father, we've got a bad situation tonight. 
We have an important guest and we need that egg beater. Can you help us find it? And then he went on to say, and the worst part of it is, Heavenly Father, my parents don't think you know where it is. <laughs> so I, I share with you, I think he does know where we are. As much as we may not feel that, I believe that in a very personal way, he knows what you feel, your name, what you're going through, and he's there. And I think this is what Roger Hoffman was talking about when he wrote this. Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, how they grow. Consider the birds in the sky, how they fly, how they fly. He clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the birds in the sky, and he will feed those who trust him and guide them with his eye. Consider the sheep of his fold. How they follow where he leads. The paths may wind across the mountain, but he knows the meadows where they feed. He clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the sheep of his fold, and he will feed those who trust him and make their heart as gold. Consider the sweet, tender children who must suffer on this earth. The pains of all of them he carries from the day of his birth. He clothes the lilies of the field. He feeds the lambs of his fold, and he will heal those who trust him and make their hearts as gold. He will make our hearts That's Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for this Sabbath day and for this opportunity we have to meet together as brothers and sisters. We are so grateful for the Addiction Recovery Program and um, for the firesides and meetings that we have and are able to hold for the church buildings and resources that we have available to us. We're grateful for Brother Alex and please bless him um, with thy spirit and bless him for his efforts to come share his testimony with us today. We're grateful for the Atonement of Jesus Christ and please help us all to trust thee more in our day-to-day -day, day -day lives that we can 
Fill thy spirit and know that um, thy timing is perfect. Please help us to serve those around us and include others into the flow of our lives so that we can bring others to Christ and um, serve those around us and feel thy spirit while doing so. We're so grateful for all the many blessings that we have, and please help us to recognize those day to day. We say this in Jesus' name, amen. Some years ago, a friend of mine, uh, we shared dinner one night, and um, him and his wife, and Narelle and I, my wife, who's right there, and uh, isn't she very beautiful, don't you think? <laughs> She's from Australia, too, so it makes it even better, it's, you know, it's something about that Australian thing. And, uh, but it was a very tough moment in his life. He told me that he had gone down a very dark path. Anybody relate to that? I know I do. And um, he'd almost lost his family through that path. Very tough time. There was one moment in the course of events in that time that he shared with me. He said that he'd been praying one night and he heard a voice in his heart very clearly. It was in his mind and heart. And it was this, and I'll call him Mark, my friend. It was Mark. Two things. First, everything's going to be okay. Just keep, put, keep putting one foot in front of the other. Second, keep looking. Keep, keep looking at my face. That's a funny, strange expression, because how can we look at his face? We don't see him physically, and yet there's something about that. I'd been thinking about it for a long time after he told me, and I thought, I know what he means, and I know that it's not just him, it's me, too. Because we're all, I was telling the Dixons later tonight, they called and the first thing I always say is, <laughs> it seems like I always say, like, I'm on step one. I'm on step one. I, I live in step one. My life is quickly unraveling, even as we speak. And uh, I love knowing that we can never unravel so much that he can't put us back together if we keep looking at his face. And so I'm gonna, I'd been thinking about this, and I was listening to this song that you're going to hear from David Tolk, if you know him. And uh, I just put these words, as I've been thinking about it, this little meditation, to this little song. And so that's what you're going to hear right now. For some reason, remember how excited we are. We were. What's your sound man's name? We were so excited that we were online here, and now. Is it? What's his name again? Yeah, he's a cool guy. I think. I think I found the button again. There it is. Let's see if it comes back on. Yeah, I think we're good. But we'll find out. I just needed to just be close to you for a second because you have that kind of calming. <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. There it is. So let's see if I can get this to work here. We had it working before, but 
Um, maybe I'll just play it on my phone. I think it'll play on my phone. It's not going to play on this thing. This <laughs> thing it won't go on by. I don't know where. I just play it on my phone, Blake. See what happens. No, you're, you're. I appreciate you, man. Uh, let's just play it on my phone here. Play it on my phone. Okay. Just got to find it on here. There we go. On a cold and lonely night In a dark and dreary distant place A sudden comfort filled my soul And I thought I saw his face As he looked Upon my heartache, I felt a love that fills all time and space. Then he took my hands in his and said, Just keep looking at my face. Then he melted all my grief Took my tears without a single trace There was a light inside my heart Like I was looking at his face Can you hear the phone? That's David Tolk. As I prayed to understand him, how he could take me in his warm embrace The shame and doubt that I have walked in Disappears inside his face Still the path's not always easy Yet he steadies every step I take And whispers deep into my soul Just keep looking at my face <clears throat> Thank you, John. You know, after John wrote that, uh, I was on the phone many months ago, and um, I told him what how that touched me, and I just kept listening to it over and over and over again. And uh, if you want to listen to that, you can go where, John? Spotify. Spotify. Keep looking at his face. Uh, my name is Elder Dixon, and I'm a grateful, recovering codependent. 
Uh, grateful to be here with you. Excited to introduce Alex. Before I do, remember that at these firesides, at the end, we always have question and answers. Uh, those of you who are online, uh, you can use a chat feature and uh, give us questions prior to the uh, fireside ending. Those of you who are here live, uh, make a note mentally or physically, and uh, we'll have probably over 20, 25 minutes-ish to go through some questions. And that's when really interesting things will come up where uh, you're inspired to ask certain questions and he's ha happened to ask, a answer them on the cuff. So, great experience. Alex is a Russian. He's from Russia. Immigrated uh, 16 years ago. Came over here to pursue the all-American dream, get his master's and uh, fulfill his dreams. He learned of the church. He became uh, uh, convinced and converted. Uh, became a member of the church and also served a mission. Uh, after his mission, fell in love, became married. And uh, the marriage lasted about three years. That's when um, the dark times began with his addiction. I uh, went to a treatment center, and then a second, and a third, and a fourth, and a fifth. Maybe the sixth treatment center would work. No. Eight treatment centers. And then the miracle happened. Um, Alex has been sober for two years plus. I've asked him to get real because I feel there's some in the audience online, perhaps here, that might feel, oh, Alex or maybe this person or that person can maintain long-term sobriety, but I can't. I'm here to testify that with the Savior's atonement, you can. Hopefully there'll be great hope infused inside your heart and your mind um, for you or the hope for a loved one that's struggling. Alex believes this. He said this, quote, that his weakness of addiction is a divine gift and his sobriety is his superpower. His mission is to serve others. Um, so can you have a prayer in your heart because he's going to try to get real vulnerable, and that's not easy. So please pray for him in your heart right now. Let's bring him up. Alex, you're on, brother. Thank you guys so much. Sister Dixon, Elder Dixon, you know how much I love you. And uh, thank you for this song. Um, I love songs, I love music. It, it has a way of opening a heart. And so, like Elder Dixon said, my name is Alex Yermakov. I am Russian by birth. Um, I'm 37 years old and I am an alcoholic, a grateful alcoholic in recovery. Um, before I address all of you guys here, I see a lot of faces that I love. Uh, some of my friends, some of the, my sponsor, my sponsee, some of the people that have huge role in my recovery. I would love to um, express my gratitude. Um, I would love to thank Elder and Sister Dixon for allowing me to go through, I believe it is the best recovery center in the world. Um, I'm very grateful for my mission president, Michael and Cindy Nider, for never giving up on me. And even when my own family kind of gave up on me, um, All right, let's do they never did. Um, I'm grateful to the uh, Renaissance Ranch Brotherhood. You guys is what keeping me alive. The activities that I participate with you, the testimonies that I hear at alumni meetings and so forth. I'm very grateful to my sister Katya that she might be watching the Zoom right now and her husband Max that always stood up 
by me. I'm very grateful to Bishop and Sister Aulis. I'm grateful to Snow family. I am grateful to Volkert family and my uh, friend Frank and Kip and Bowman family. They're like my own. They feed me when I don't have food. Um, I'm grateful for Andersons and Jeff and just being my coach in this recovery journey. I'm so thankful to Mike Bullock. I'm so grateful to Chris Groves. I'm very grateful to the ARP program of the LDS Church um, and the recovery community of AA. Uh, and most importantly, I'm very grateful to my Father in Heaven that made it possible for me today to talk. Um, I want to ask you guys a question um, online and here in the audience. Uh, can I please have your guys' permission to be vulnerable and to be me? It is the hardest thing in life to be put in a certain box and try to act a certain way. And I just learned it recently that everything, um, every emotion in our body can be um, measured electronically, right? Like the emo emotion of shame has a frequency of 20. Emotion of love has a frequency of 500. Emotion of courage has a frequency of 250. Emotion of enlightenment is 700 plus. Do you guys know what is the most powerful frequency that a human body can, um, you know, send out? It is emotion of authenticity. When I speak my story, when I say what happened to me, when I say what is true, then this is the most powerful thing that anyone can do. Um, I believe that every single one of you here has a powerful story, but Today is my fireside, and I'm going to share my story with your permission. Um, I pray really hard, even right now, that what I say will touch someone's heart. And the purpose of me sharing today is I hope, just like Elder Dixon said, that what I say will help you to leave this room or this podcast a better man and a better woman, and maybe you would receive guidance in your own life today because it is all about today. It is the most powerful concept that I learned in the AA is just for today. And so with that said, there is a parable that I would like to share. And this parable is about three wise men. Have you guys heard about a parable of three wise men? It goes like this. There were three wise men that took from a man a crown of his godhood. And the first wise man said, let us hide this crown of man's godhood on the top of the highest mountain. And I am almost certain the man would never find it. And the other two wise men said, well, don't you know how men are? They're going to climb, they're going to hike, they're going to set a goal to conquer this tallest mountain. And finally, they will come across that crown of his godhood there. It is not wise. The second wise man said, well, why don't we put this crown of man's godhood deep in the ocean? We will find the deepest spot and he will never get there. And the other two said, well, don't you know how men are? They're going to swim, they're going to sink, they're going to come up with submarines and technologies, but in their persistence and stupidity, they will come across that crown of man's godhood. So let's not put it there. And the third wise man said, well, how about this? I have an idea. Why don't we put man's godhood inside himself? He will for sure never find it. And so my message today to you guys is that something that I discovered in 37 years of my life is that God lives inside of me. And that God sometimes can be blocked or I can block this God or in other words, disconnect from myself and lose that ability to know that I am God in the embryo, which is, which is what the you know, Christian faith teaches. And so the question that I have, and I always had when I read the Bible for the first time, was this. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And so as I'm sharing tonight, I want you guys to think about your own life. I want you to think about moments in your life when you knowingly 
did something to disappoint that inner God inside yourself. And as a result of these actions, you became a prisoner of a self-built prison. I don't know if you knew, but did you know that the original name of the book of Alcoholics Anonymous was The Way Out? And so that is what I found in my life. I discovered in my life that um, I love this life. I love, <laughs> I love this life. I love to party. I love drugs, alcohol, and anything that makes me feel good and also wholesome recreation. I also found that today, living in 2023, in a more or less free world, I mean, we have wars going on and pandemics and so forth, but we don't have slavery like in the medieval times or some Egyptian times before Christ, right? People are free. You got your phone, you got your room, you got your car. But is it possible to live in a free world and be a prisoner? Is it possible to have a phone, a car, you know, Oreo cookies, you know, orange juice in your fridge? and still be a slave. And so this is what the addiction of alcoholism did to me in my life. I've discovered that I can live in a free country. A lot of people from all around the world try to come to America to achieve their you know, American dream, if there is such a thing. And I can be living in a free country and I can be a slave, slave to my own choices, slave to my own addiction. And, and be very unhappy and miserable. And so I don't have precise outline of what I'm gonna share with you guys. I know that I wanna tell you a couple of stories from my life and if you can relate and if you can connect to some of those things that I share, then, uh, then awesome. I pray that you know, it will enlighten you and, and make you a better man or a woman. Um, my dad called me today on the way to church and uh, he was, talking about, he's like, he's 71 years old, by the way, it's his birthday today, and it's, I don't believe in coincidences, I know it's not a coincidence, and so, as he found out that I'm going to be talking at the Addiction Recovery Fireside, he started giving me all these advices that are outdated, and honestly, they don't apply, but because I love him, and he's my father, and recovery taught me to validate people's feelings, I was just listening to <laughs> all that nonsense he was telling me, but some of the things he said, they really were interesting and they kind of gave me an insight on, you know, like my, my, my authentic story. My dad was telling me something like this, son, make sure that you don't tell them all this bad stuff that you've done when you were using, because number one thing that you have to remember as a son of a professor from Russia is your reputation. Reputation is the most <laughs> important thing that you have in life. So make sure that you, you know, you don't tell them any hints on onto how horrible your life were. And I started laughing inside myself because I realized that if my dad knew that there is there is no more destroying my reputation. Like I'm literally on ground zero going up. <laughs> he said things like, son. Please tell them that, you know, me as a mother, me as your father and your mother, we didn't really know, you know, how to help you. And I'm like, why is he telling me this? Because we in Soviet Union, we were under the Iron Curtain. And Iron Curtain was this thing where like capitalistic society was separate from communistic society. And we didn't have AA. We didn't have Alcoholics Anonymous. And so when we found out all those things about you, you know, we didn't know how to help you. And so as he was telling me this, I realized that what my old man is telling me is that he is still ashamed. And this is what I learned in recovery, that addiction and the core of addiction is self-hate that is based in shame. When I'm ashamed of myself, I say something like, I am not worthy, right? I am not good enough. And ironically, half of this valley who are members of the church they have the same disease of being ashamed of themselves. And so what I hope my message in my stories today, it's about self-love. It's about self-care. It's about discovering that you're a powerful son or daughter of God, that God lives inside of you. And that especially if you're an addict, you came into this world with a very different emotional makeup. You're so sensitive like me 
to things that happen around you that you just have to somehow medicate it. You cannot just go, you know, pick up your kids at soccer practices and, you know, cook breakfast for Sunday and, you know, do all those things that like perfect Mormon families do, right? You, you have to put in your body something like me because there is so many frequencies and emotions happen that I just don't want to feel. And that's what makes me an addict. What does, what does it mean to be an alcoholic? You guys think drinking alcohol makes you an alcoholic? You think doing drugs makes you a drug addict? What I discovered is this wonderful, wonderful fact. And the fact is this. I'm an alcoholic because I have a dual disease. The disease that has a dual nature. The book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which was written by Bill Wilson in 1939, after the Bible and the Book of Mormon for me, is the greatest book written on the planet. The reason for that is it is the first book in the history of the world that talks about a disease that is dual in nature. You have a bodily or, you know, your physical allergy to alcohol or drugs, which is an abnormal reaction, which is, you know, desire to do more of what kills you, basically. And then I have this mental obsession, which definition of obsession is an idea that overrides any other idea, like no matter what I just want to use. And Alcoholics Anonymous book was written by Bill Wilson, and it talks about disease of addiction being a spiritual malady. And this is what I came to. I came to believe and know that unless I straighten out spiritually, it is impossible for me to straighten out physically and mentally. I have to have a solution in my life for my condition, which I was born with, the disease of alcoholism, that actually works. I've tried everything. Like it says in my bio, I, I went through eight treatment centers. First time in my life I was arrested in Las Vegas where I served my mission. How shaming is that? And... Um, <laughs> I don't know why I feel strongly I want to share this. So yesterday I went to the temple, right? As a member of LDS faith, I go to the temple. I'm very in a good standing in church right now. I love going to the temple and something crazy happened in the celestial room. And those of you that don't know much about temples, temples uh, temple is a house of God. You might believe it or might not. Again, I don't care. It's my fireside. This is what I believe. <laughs> And so in the temples, there are procedures and ceremonies that allow families to be sealed together for time and all eternity. And so something I chose to do yesterday at the Saratoga Springs Temple was sealings. And sealing is a procedure where husband and wife sealed for time and all eternity, which means that there is a power of God that's used to bring like a family unit and make sure that they're together, not just in this life, but in the life to come. Kind of cool concept, right? And so as I'm in the <laughs> ceiling room, the ceremony is going, and there is this cute newlywed couple right across the altar from each other. And they're maybe like in their mid-20s. And as the ceremony goes, the husband or the guy starts, uh, his face goes towards the altar, and we all try to understand what's going on. And as he's leaning forward and his face touches the altar, I understand that the dude is unconscious. Something happened where he passed out. And so that literally happened. The dude passed out. We, um, we put him on the carpet. And then what started happening after that was almost like nonsensical to me. His face was pale. His wife was trying to vent him like this. And there were all these people coming in the room trying to help, right? This one dude came in and he put his feet on the stool, right, on the chair. Then this lady came and said, what happened after we described what happened? She's like, oh, he's having an emotional breakdown. Let me call the nurse. She left the room. Then another person speedily came in trying to help and said, oh, let me call the recorder, right, of the temple, right? He has a basic medical, uh, you know, education. And so... As things are happening around this guy laying on the floor, I look at his face, I understand he's pale, and I know he's unconscious. I know also that he's breathing. And I don't have first aid, you know, um, um, education and training, uh, but I've helped a lot of people in the past, especially because of drug addiction, to come out of, you know, situations when they're unconscious or they're losing, you know, 
they're uh, losing their mind or losing their life many times, right? Just do it intuitively. I've done it many times. And um, as I'm looking at this, you know, thing, about five minutes into them trying to help him, I understand that he's not being helped. He's still laying down. The ceremony is stopped. His face becomes more and more pale. His wife doing this is not really helping. And I understand that an action needs to be taken because, and then comes the recorder and starts, I'm like, okay, this is the guy that's going to save the guy. And he starts talking about some nerve in your neck that when it's a heat outside and when you're kneeled down by the altar, the nerve pinches down and gives us this four minute lecture about how a nerve works. All of a sudden, probably driven by the spirit of God or whatever. I don't know what it was. I just freaked out. I grabbed the dude because his wife, prior to him fading, said something about him donating plasma. And I donated plasma before. And I know that it's a simple issue of water. When I donate plasma and I don't drink enough liquid, right, sometimes people faint. I fainted before. So without waiting for anyone, without excusing myself, without explaining anything, I literally grabbed the dude, put his arm around my shoulder and they carried him to the closest water fountain and when he drank some water his his color of his face came back his eyes opened up they were all uh talking about that nerve that <laughs> the recorder was talking about and you know that experience yesterday taught me a great great thing when a person is dying of thirst and he needs water what is a good it give him when somebody who is unqualified or don't know what to do comes with, with advices and suggestions, right? The dude needs water. You give him water, he drinks, he lives, right? And we were in the temple. We were in the temple of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the house of the Lord. You would think people are enlightened and moved by the Spirit, right? And they would figure that thing out. It wasn't until Alex from Russia took the guy brought him to the water, the guy drank, and the guy lived, <laughs> metaphorically. So this is what AA is for me. I was, uh, I was born in 1986, the year when the nuclear explosion in Ukraine happened. I don't know if any of you remember that, but there was this big explosion of this nuclear factory that happened. And... Um, Iron Curtain was lifted up in 1991, and we had a lot of drugs that flooded to my country from Afghanistan and from China. And back then, there were no 12-step recovery programs or anything like that. Addicts were simply healed by being taken into the downstairs of the building, being handcuffed for about a month. They would feed them, right? And then after they sober up for about a month, they would send them to those remote work camps where they would work intensive physical labor for like a year or two or three. And the success rate of this thing, they say about 40%. I don't believe in it. But this is how Russia was dealing with um, addiction, basically, back then. So when I was little, I knew nothing about addiction other than I was afraid of drug addicts and people that use syringes and they were just something you should be ashamed of, and if you know that someone is doing drugs, you just stay away from them as far as you can. But when I was little, I had a dream, and the dream was I always wanted to be a preacher or a priest. And uh, I would watch those cable shows from America, right, where, um, you know, those preachers would quote from the Bible. And so when I came, when I came here, right, and I came to America, and that was a year before Barack Obama <laughs> became a president, first black president, remember that. So that was the year when I came. And I've discovered something really, really cool. I've discovered something that in Russia we didn't have for 75 years. There was no gospel, right? In America, you're all here, you're spoiled. There's this church and this church and Presbyterians, right? And non-denominational and whatever, right? And LDS church and Catholic church and all those Christian churches and other churches fighting. In Russia, we have nothing like that. There is just the Communistic Party, all wise, all knowing Communistic Party. <laughs> they tell you what to do, and people are dumb and stupid, right? Basically. <laughs> so when I came to America, I started, uh, and you guys may judge me, but it's part of my story. I, uh, 
um, I feel like I need to share one or two stories from my past so you could relate. Um, I came to the state of Florida, and in Florida, I, you know, started smoking marijuana. And then smoking marijuana, I discovered that my favorite type of weed <laughs> is cocaine. <laughs> then I started doing cocaine and all those drugs, and the first time I read, I read the Bible, I was completely high on coke the whole time. I opened the Old Testament, and it said, you know, God separated the light from the darkness, and he saw that it was good. I'm like, heck yeah, that's a cool dude. God separated the firmament from waters of the sea, and he saw that it was good. I'm like, heck yes. This is the most amazing thing I um, read in my life. And then when I came to Utah, I read the Book of Mormon. And, th and that is also, you guys can judge me. You can do whatever. I don't care. Accept me or not. You gave me permission to be authentic. True story. The first time I read the Book of Mormon, from cover to cover, I was smoking weed like an Afro man the whole time. And um, discovering the gospel of Jesus Christ helped me learn something about myself, helped me learn the truth about who I was and all those concepts and answered a lot of questions that I had in my life. And, and uh, one of my favorite scriptures is the scripture from the Book of Ether and the Book of Mormon. And that was the scripture that was on the uh, Renaissance Range front you know, room in the IOP program in Sandy. It is uh, Jesus Christ talking to the prophet that lived on the American continent. We don't know his name. We just know he's the brother of Jared, right? And he says this, he's, Jesus Christ says, And if men come unto me, I will show them their weakness. I give man weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. And if men come unto me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. I love that scripture a lot because in the scripture, basically, God promises me and you that if you have weaknesses, there is a way for those weaknesses to become strength. And so after I served my LDS mission and was married in the temple and my marriage didn't work out, I discovered the hard way that I'm an addict and I'm an alcoholic. I started using drugs and alcohol, and it doesn't matter how much I try to stop I wasn't able to. The first recovery center that I came was Haven downtown, but then I went to the Renaissance Ranch, and my counselor, Chris, if, Chris, if you're watching right now, just so you know, I love you and thank you. Um, she basically helped me realize that just believing in God and just having faith is not enough. If I have a disease of alcoholism, then I have to take certain steps because the disease, and I don't know if you guys know, but this is what I learned in Russia, because in America, everyone always talks about disease of alcoholism. Like, what is the disease of alcoholism, right? I honestly always thought, guys, that they talk about disease of alcoholism because they're working in a recovery center and they need to make their paycheck. You know, they went to University of Utah, they got their SETSI degree or whatever, counseling licenses, and now they're teaching me about disease of alcoholism. Like, it's a BS. Like, go back to school. Like, I just love smoking crack. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have disease of alcoholism recreationally every other weekend. But it was my sixth or seventh treatment center. And when I came to Russia on step one, they gave me this paper and they made me write about five characteristics of disease of alcoholism. So I want you guys to know it's a self-diagnosis that you have to do. No one was able to tell me that I'm an alcoholic. I had to basically look at my life and what is happening and realize that I am an alcoholic, which is a step one. Yeah. We came to believe that our life has become unmanageable and that we are powerless. I am powerless, right? And so disease of alcoholism has those five characteristics and you guys are welcome to like scan you through, right? So number one, it's a, and I translated from Russian, it's a primary or yeah. primary premarital disease, which means the disease came first, then came drinking. 
It's a misconception where people start drinking, they become an alcoholic. No, I was born this way. I was born genetically from my father and mother where I should have never touched drugs and alcohol. Right? I have this allergy in my body that makes me want to put more of it, you know, so I could medicate my emotions and condition, the internal condition that I have, right? So it's a, it's a primary or premarital, primordial, I'm saying it maybe not right. Uh, it means the disease was first, then came drinking. Second, it's chronic. Chronic means it's right. lasting a long time and slow to heal. However, we know that from Alcoholics Anonymous book that 2.2 million people were successfully recovered. We never in recovery talk about, oh, I'm recovered, right? But there are people that live a happy, joyous, and free life, right? They still have to do their daily maintenance steps. Number three, it's incurable. There is no known cure. We only get daily reprieve contingent on fit spiritual condition, right? Did you call your sponsor today? Did you go to the meeting today? Did you do your steps today? It's all about what you're doing today, right? Number four is progressive. Over any period of time, it only gets worse, not better. So every time I would accumulate periods of sobriety, every time I would relapse, I would get to even worse consequences, jails, institutions, and death, right? And number five, it's lethal. Lethal means you're going to have a premature death, meaning you will not live as long as God measured to you. Let's say you were supposed to live 93 years. Because of alcoholism, you're going to live 36 or 52 or whatever, right? So this disease of alcoholism has those five characteristics, and I had to, in my life, come to the point where my life is not just unmanageable, but I am an alcoholic. Because no matter what I do and no matter how hard I try to stop drugs and alcohol, I cannot do that. And the craziest thing that I learned, and something that maybe will help some of you, is that I realized that honestly it had nothing to do with substances. I had everything to do with how I feel inside. I just don't want to feel bad. I don't want to feel that shame. I don't want to feel those hundreds of forms of fear that I was driven my whole life. I want to feel better. And drugs and alcohol were solving this problem for a long, long time until it stopped. Um, let's see here, back work. There are two stories that I wanted to share. I don't know if I have time. One is called Ditch Witch, <laughs> and another one is called Ghostbuster Story. So, uh, so to illustrate to you guys that you know I'm an, a, a real um, alcoholic, I want you to know I could write books, and we all, you know, who drink and use drugs, have crazy stories that qualify us to, you know, be in the fellowship. Um, I feel maybe I shouldn't be doing that right now, but what I should tell you is my bottom, right? And my bottom were those three moments in my life. So two and a half years ago, I came back home to Russia after living in Florida for about three years. And um, as a result of me, you know, going through heartbreak after my divorce, I was using drugs and alcohol for several years. Um, me and my mom were walking around this lake in Russia, and my mom asked me a question. She said, son, can I ask you something? She goes, why do you live in America? And I said, mom, you know I live in America because I have an American dream. And she goes, well, how is this, how is this working out for you? And I go, well, as, as you know, it's not perfectly, but you know, I'm, I'm doing all I can, but I'm living. And as you guys, what you should understand, two and a half years ago, I didn't look like this. Right, I, I was maybe like 80 pounds under. I was all shaking. I was all, you know, in the drug language. I was tweaking a little bit, right? I couldn't, it was really hard for me to talk because all my drugs and alcohol were removed from me. And my mom, you know, probably feeling sorry for me. And not, not, you know how sometimes God talks to us in a language we can understand. Sometimes God says things through other people that touch our heart. And that was the moment my mom said, to me this thing she said Alex you know you live in America because you want to have American dream right because you want to be free she goes ironically I'm an international journalist you know I meet a lot of people I you know for my job I communicate with a lot of people I associate with many different levels of people she goes out of all the people on the planet that I know you my son is the most unfree person that I know and I remember when she said that, it really hit me hard. And I realized that 
I'm doing something wrong. I realized that she's absolutely right. I realized that I live for many years in this prison and I desperately need to get out of it. And so um, second thing happened right after that conversation, that was the July of 2021. I was through willpower, basically sober in, in Russia. And then I came to America six months sober with this strong resolution not to use drugs and alcohol again. And uh, when I went through custom controls, right, picked up my luggage at Miami International Airport, uh, all those plans that I had, they didn't come to pass because within an hour I was high. I was using, I was in this hotel room with my back then girlfriend, we were doing drugs. And um, I've experienced the moment of incomprehensible demoralization. I've, uh, I've, I've felt something that I've never felt before. I felt very strongly that I don't want to be in my own body. In fact, I just simply want to die. I realized that all my attempts and years of me, you know, trying to be sober and going through rehabs failed. And once again, I failed again. There was a complete powerlessness. And that was the moment, friends, when God basically reached out to me and said, Alex, you're not to use drugs and alcohol anymore, but you are to do my will because otherwise you're going to die. Would you like to die? I said, no, God, I don't want to die. He goes, are you sure? <laughs> I go, yeah, I'm sure. I'm, a, I'm afraid. I'm not. I have my American dream. I have all these goals, but I don't, I feel like, I feel so bad, God. I don't know what to do. And this is where God introduced me. For the first time, it felt like, even though I've already been in the rooms of AA, to Alcoholics Anonymous and 12 Steps. It was the first time in my life when I surrendered to the point where I didn't want to do it because somebody told me I need to do it or my life is unmanageable. I honestly, guys, I, it was a moment that, you know, this is why I'm sober in front of you today because I had this real thorough step one with myself. I was looking in the mirror at my own reflection and first time in my life I was realizing it's not that I didn't even like what I see. I realized that drugs and alcohol do not work anymore. I realized that there is some demon inside of me that just wants to kill me. And I realized that I need to do something. And so when I um, came to my bishop in Florida, right, because I was seeking help, he said this phrase, he said, Alex, honestly, excommunicating you wouldn't even be a punishment. And I'm like, what the heck is this supposed to mean? And as I'm sitting in his office, you know how like you come to the temple or like you're at a spiritual event like this, you can feel the Holy Ghost, you can feel the presence of God, you can feel the peace and serenity, right? Well, this bowl of darkness that was around me was the opposite of that. It was not the bowl of light, it was a bowl of darkness. And I was shivering on my chair and I realized that I'm going to be excommunicated from something that I was looking for my whole life. I want you guys to know, regardless of what you believe, I know that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true Church of God on the planet today. I want you guys to know that there is a prophet of God on the planet today. I want you guys to know that the Book of Mormon is a true book that talks about Jesus Christ visiting American continent. And I want you guys to know that knowing all this and living the gospel of Jesus Christ is not enough if you're an addict and alcoholic like me. You have to do the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. You have to surrender to the point where, like me, you will discover that the atonement of Jesus Christ is the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that are done in order, in sequence, and with, with, a willing, with a willing heart. I want you guys to know, and I don't know if you knew, but the, the Alcoholics Anonymous is the only organization that um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reached out to externally and said, guys, we love what you do. Can we please use it, you know, for our own thing? This is where ARP program came. Did you guys know that Bill Wilson wrote the book of Alcoholics Anonymous between first and second year of his uh, sobriety? So basically, by now I should have written a book like Bill Wilson did. Do you know? This is how I know it's of God. And all my knowledge of God led me to the point where God lives inside of me. I am God. I am God in the embryo. I came to this planet to do a special mission. But how can I know my strength if I don't know my weakness? How can I make my weakness a strength if I don't know God, who is the author of this freaking process? 
There is a page, uh, page 124 in Alcoholics Anonymous book that says, that saved my life. Cling to the thought, in God's hands, darkest past, one day will become your most precious possession. I want you guys to know that two, a little over two years ago, I felt lonely, I felt disconnected, I felt suicidal, I felt so dark, I felt hopeless. I felt something that can only be described by this phrase, incomprehensible demoralization. I want you guys to know that today, I, my life and everything I do, and I have a lot of troubles, I have a lot of challenges, but I am in such a better place than I was two years ago. I actually don't want to die. That's a win. I actually uh, want to live and thrive. I actually am not restless, irritable, discontented most of the time because most of the time I'm happy, joyous, and free. And the cool thing about the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, it gives me opportunity to help others. All my life, guys. All my life, I wanted to help others. I come from a family where we all help each other. My mom runs the biggest crisis center for women and children in Russia. There's 48 crisis centers. They had to be shut down because of war. My mom would sell her, please forgive me, it's a Russian expression. My mom would sell her own underwear to help a woman in need. My dad is helping people and has an organization too. My sister, my whole family, and I always wanted to be like them. And I never knew how, because all my life I was selfish, self-centered, not giving a dang about anybody. And when I discovered that I'm an addict, an alcoholic, it was a devastation to me. Because all my life I knew that I'm created for some bigger purpose. All my life I was taught by my same parents that I'm special, that there is a mission for me in life. And drugs and alcohol put me on my knees. <laughs> Through me, they took away everything. They took away my family. They took away all my friendships. I burned so many bridges. I've done so many bad things to other people. And when I got to the point where I said, God, this is the end. Please take me home. I don't want to be here anymore. He showed me, Heavenly Father showed me, Jesus Christ showed me through 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous that what I thought was the end <laughs> was really the beginning. You know, I'm not embarrassed to cry right now. My dad would say, real men don't cry, we're in Russia, we don't cry. I love you, dad, if you're watching this. <laughs> but I want you guys to know that because of doing steps, because of people in my life, because of God, my higher power, my weaknesses are becoming strength. I do have hope today. And all this dark past that I had, all these darknesses, are becoming, slowly becoming light. I'm privileged and honored to speak to you today because I feel like in full sincerity, my ego is big, but my ego is not me. In full sincerity, I felt for a long time there is nothing special about me. I'm just destined to freaking die from alcoholism. And today I have my life back. I want you guys to know that if you feel lonely, if you feel scared, if you feel that your life is over, just know this one thing. Alex from Russia is telling you, it's not the end, it is the beginning. Because the end of something is the beginning of something new. And I'm going to finish with that. It's my favorite parable. It goes like this. Father broke down a map of the world to 50 different pieces. He threw to the corner it all over, scattering it, and said to a little boy, when you put the map together, we will play. 
Three minutes later, a little boy brought back the whole map glued and pieced together. A father asked, how did you do it? On the back of the map was a picture of the man. Once the man was pieced together, the whole world fell into place. Thank you. would like to invite Elder Maybe to come up for closing remarks. And on his way up, I would like to uh, tell you how, how great and amazing each of you are and to tell you that I know that what Alex has shared with us tonight is true and it's something that we, we can all believe in and follow. My own daughter has just reached her second year of sobriety and I know that the program reach as many people as we can plainly see by the evidence of Alex and his life. I know the church is true. I know God loves each and every one of us. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we've been richly fed tonight. Very grateful to Alex for being vulnerable, and that's why we come to these firesides. That's one of the highlights of this, is we can all come and be very open and very honest with one another. Just real briefly tonight, I just want to remind you, um, uh, we have, uh, for our upcoming fireside next month, we've got flyers that are available on the table out here. We encourage you every fourth Sunday at 6 p.m. to be here. We're grateful for all those who are involved in putting these together with the Union Fort Stake and with Elder and Sister Dixon, and Elder and Sister Charette, and and uh, uh, so grateful for all of their efforts. The other thing you will find out on the table is the uh, what we call the pink sheet in our mission here. This lists all of the meetings, both uh, online and in person. We encourage you to get a, a copy of this and, and take advantage of the many opportunities to attend meetings um, any day of the week, essentially. And finally, tonight, as we've talked about before, you're all familiar with the uh, Addiction Recovery Guide and the Family Support Manual. Um, we are told, we have not seen, but we are told that these are changing and new manuals will be available soon. Uh, we perhaps we'll hear more, we'll, we will hear more about this in the coming week or so. But uh, be aware of this. We always encourage the use of personal copies. Of course, all of this is available online through the Gospel Library, but there just isn't anything like having a personal copy that you can kind of keep as a personal journal and take notes and use this as a resource guide in between meetings and those kinds of things. So we are just so grateful uh, as a Sandy Addiction Recovery Mission to, to be with you tonight and grateful for your attendance and, and uh, grateful, Alex, for your, your thoughts, your comments, your spirit, your testimony. I, too, add my testimony to yours. Uh, God lives. Jesus is the Christ. He is in the details of our lives. Uh, so grateful for the power of prayer, brothers and sisters, where we can literally drop to our knees and call upon him and ask for guidance and direction and receive that guidance and direction. Looking forward to general conference next Sunday. Um, in our mission, there will be no change in schedule to any of our addiction recovery meetings, so we encourage you to attend on Sunday evenings as well. And uh, uh, Again, thank you for being here tonight and leave my testimony and my love for each one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The closing psalm will be hymn number 220, Lord, I Would Follow Thee, after which the closing prayer will be offered by Elder Bowman. Following the closing prayer, Elder Dixon will moder moderate the question and answer period.
All right, dear kind Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this day. We thank Thee for the spirit that we've been able to feel and the, the words that were shared with us. Um, we thank Thee for Alex and his wisdom and, and his willingness to be vulnerable and share his experiences and, and the knowledge that he's gained through those experiences. Bless him and, and help him to know how much we appreciate and love uh, him and his experiences, the words that he shared, and, and the power they'll continue to to spread through his message. And please be with us, each and every one of us, that uh, we can have I Spirit with us, that it will continue to guide us and to help us become which those who thou would have us be, and bless those around us, our loved ones, sponsors, and and those who support who support us, that they will. Um, continue to do their best to understand us, that they can um, support us the best way. And be with us, Father, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Alex. That was truly vulnerable and very powerful. Thank you. Um, we've been asked to, uh, because of the meetings here, to shut it down about 22, 23 after. So we've got uh, just... Mm, six, seven minutes, eight minutes uh, to ask questions. So if you have questions, go ahead and uh, get ready. Alex, come on up, brother. And as they in the uh, audience mention a question, uh, repeat it so that online can hear, okay? okay? I've got a couple here, unless we've got some right now that want to ask some. Okay, we got two right here. Repeat that. So the question I'm asked is, how do I keep doing it after going through eight recovery centers? Or basically, what keeps me moving? Honestly, the honest answer would be, it, it is probably God. I wasn't able to do that on my own. I've given up many, many times. Uh, I'm a type of person that, there is a saying in AA, I'm not going to say it right now, but it basically means you get really offended, you turn around and go. Um, but it's it's a miracle. I don't know. I I never in my life thought I would be in a moment where I have an honor and privilege to give a fireside because I'm over two years sober. I thought it was done. And just when I gave up, this is when it happened, just when I gave up, just when I thought it's the end, God showed me. But I was willing to do the steps. That was the difference. Seven treatment centers, I wasn't a able to get the sponsor. I wasn't able to do the steps. I was doing it for somebody else. It was the first time when I surrendered. I looked at myself and I'm like, Alex, you're an alcoholic. I don't want to be an alcoholic, but it's like, look at your life, like you're gonna die. So, I don't know if it answers your question, but that's it. Good. Colton Snow, how? Hi. I love you too. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. So the question comes from Colton, who is my sponsee, who knows me very well. Thank you, Colton. I love you too, who just expressed how much he loves me, not just as a sponsor, but as a friend. I love you too, Colton. And the question is, because he knows me and how imperfect I am, even after two years, he personally is aware of many things that I struggle with in my life. What do I do in my life today, even though I have struggles to keep going? after two years your dailies. My, my dailies okay so so number one thing we just only have today yesterday is already gone tomorrow might never be here and now the COVID hit or whatever war with russia will start whatever we don't know right we only have today true story what am i doing today that's the question i ask every day every day i i wake up at about 4 45 used to at about 5 15 now and i start with a prayer and i ask god what he wants me to do that day 
And every day God tells me the first thing after he gives me peace is that I need to go to work. I think the biggest character defect of any addict or alcoholic is we're slothful. We don't like to do stuff. Like you can process feelings and reflect with counselor all day. But if you're not putting in work, like here in America, we work another day, another dollar. Like I got to show up, whether for Uncle Sam or for your own business, you got to wake up with the sun and go. That's my personal belief. You do whatever. But I go work every day I work. Every day I work out in the gym and do something uh, for my self-care that makes me love myself. Meditation helps me love myself. Prayer makes me, I pray every day. I read scriptures every day. I meditate every day. I recently, because of Colton, thank you, got a membership at uh, Beach's Standing Place, right? That's why I have to stand, <laughs> right? But I go to the gym daily. Once a week I go to church. But every day I do something that has to do with my recovery, as in I check in with my sponsor, I usually go to four or five meetings a week, right? But I try to go to a meeting every day. I read something from the Alcoholics Anonymous book. And every day I do step 10, which is my nightly inventory, which guides me through the night. So day in and day out, I do those things. And over a period of time, it accumulates to two years of sobriety. And you know what coolest thing I discovered? That even after two years being sober, I'm just as far from relapse as anybody with 24 hours. Good, good. Others? Okay, here's one. Um, you talked about shame. You talked about you know self hatred, and and, and th you just want to numb out through your drug of choice. Yeah. How did you work through that shame? Um, self love. Uh, I recently read a book by Bryn Brene Brown. Brene Brown. It's called The Gifts of Imperfection, and she talks about wholehearted living, where to live wholeheartedly, I have to be able to overcome shame by feeling myself worthy now. This is the key. I am worthy now. I am not worthy when I will finish Renaissance Ranch, then I'll be worthy. When three uh, warrants for arrest will be pulled out, you know, I'll be worthy. When I will get this $40 million an hour job, then I will be worthy. No, I'm worthy. Like, like Colton Morgan uh, says, you know, the moment I take a breath, and by the way, he hates me for me being LDS. He's like, you, your LDS standards. And the cult of love you, bro, if you're watching this. And he's like, all your worthiness talks. He goes, I when I was sleeping in the ditch, being arrested 11 times, and I woke up from this drug zombie mode, right? And I took my first breath. <gasps> he goes, that is the moment when you're worthy. And you know what? I cannot, I, I, I have to agree with him. So the way I deal with shame, and I recently had a kind of a crazy breakup with the girl I was dating from church. And I think... She uh, couldn't bear the fact that I'm an addict. Her whole family is like stake presidents and patriarchs and bishops and stuff. And we broke up and there were many things they were going into. But I realized that she's ashamed of my past, right? And because she's ashamed of my past, right? Do I have to be ashamed of my past? No. I'm going to continue to love because that's my authentic story. That's who I am. I cannot run away from it. I cannot run away from the fact I had warrants for arrest and been arrested in jail and been to 11 psyche wards. This is a part of my story, but that's a beautiful thing. Sometimes God separates us or puts us in the environments where he is about to level us up. And God, when he levels us up, and I know this from my life experience, when people later in time see what God has done with our life, they're like, what the heck? And this is what's literally happening with me. I'm overcoming shame by self-love. And this is what I'm learning from my friends and people that surround me. Self-love, it, it, it's a daily thing. If I go to the gym and I get endorphins and dopamine, you will feel better. That's why all the Mormons run. Like, did you notice everyone in Utah is like in some sort of 5K or marathon? There is a reason for that. If you read scriptures... Do, okay, don't read the Book of Mormon. No, grab something. Come on. You, you owe it to yourself. Read the Bible from cover to cover before you die. Do you know what's the richest place on the planet? Can I ask you? Do you know? What's the richest place on the planet? It's a cemetery. Do you know how many people lay down there with their dreams and goals and things they planned for their life and all the stuff that never happened? You are here right now. You're alive. I'm alive. We can change our life. And this life change starts with loving myself. How can I love someone else if I don't love myself? And 
I came from an environment in Russia where they shame you for being an addict. Like my dad is a professor in the university. He's like, Alex, please don't post on Facebook like all these things and stuff. It's called spiritual strip tease. I go, dude, I'm just happy that I'm 90 days sober. He's like, I had 600 students that read your post and now they say, Professor's son is an addict in America. And I'm like, dad, I don't care. That's my story. He's like, I care. Take it down. <laughs> so I overcome shame with self-love. And the way I do self-love is many, many different mini actions that allow me to love myself. Wow. You know, one other thing I notice is, is your service. Your service and still being, you know, selfish, you're selfless. And I've seen that in Helping your others. Helping you know, others gives you your self-love sure. as well. Awesome. I wish we had a bunch more time. we got to shut it down. But um, stay right here. <laughs> I love this guy because I love who he's becoming. And I hope he's a pillar of hope for many of you. Those of us who have many times said, I'm not going to use again. And then we pick up again and again. That's his story. And now he's living a life of sobriety and of, of, of dreams and of hopes. I uh, love you, brother. I testify that recovery is real. The 12 steps are a practical application of the atonement of Jesus Christ to help us do what we cannot do for ourselves. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Hey, everybody, our next fireside um, is going to be incredible. Uh, it is the fourth week, as it always is. And um, so you know who's speaking. Just to let you know, got it here somewhere. There we go. Colleen Johnston, she's in, uh, well, she, for, for 20 years she was out there using. 20 years. Um, she is uh, an incredible miracle, as is Alex. You will not want to miss this. Please come uh, the fourth Sunday of next uh, uh, month for an incredible story of hope and healing with her. Okay? Thanks so much. We got meetings starting in five minutes. Thanks.